This is episode 389 of our podcast, The Journey, a conversational leadership culture and creativity. Today is a special day. I have a special guest that is going to come and join me for a special conversation. My brother, David Hernandez, you're going to hear about his background, what he does for a living, and then specifically the ministry that he has globally. I mean, this brother is something special. I've been blessed to engage into beautiful conversations and to see God at work and, uh, you know, through him and in him and his beautiful family as well. Today, what we're doing, we're discussing, we are navigating the scriptures together with a specific topic over the issue of peace, joy, the understanding of how we face the reality of the coronavirus. How do we um, witness to one another and testify of the goodness of the God of the Bible? So today, I want to thank you for joining, and you guys are in for a treat. God bless you. Today is uh, Friday, March the 27th, and I have the privilege to have a a uh, quick conversation with my brother, David. David, it's good to see you, brother. Would you mind introducing yourself for us today? I'm, I'm very happy to be uh, talking with you, Vidal, and I'm glad that we're able to communicate in this way. And uh, um, it's been a, I'm David. I'm an obstetrician gynecologist, been here for about 15 years in the Valley, and uh, saw patients today. And uh, I'm sure as you as a minister and a pastor, you're uh, answering, getting a lot of questions. As well, so am I. There's a lot of anxiety, just sense of despair and hopelessness. And um, so, you know, it, granted, uh, we can come up with many methods and, and uh, things to uh, comfort ourselves. But what we'll always find out, um, we're always going to come short when we look to the world. The, the world uh, uh, offer us and make uh, plans, but things don't always work out. As we can see in this time, uh, talking to friends around the world that we minister to, uh, my friends in Miramar uh, who runs an orphanage, here the problem was trying to get toilet paper, over there was trying to get rice for the children in the orphanage. Mm. And uh, another orphanage we work with in Africa, um, they were just getting started in February. They opened up and they had to close because of the Corona crisis. So this is affecting not only locally, but internationally. So I think it's very appropriate that, uh, that a pastor and a physician come together and, and presenting the answer to us believers that are disciples of the Lord Jesus Christ. And, and although our vocations are def different, um, uh, that's, that's definitely uh, part of the case here, David. One thing that you and I have in common is the passion that we have for the gospel, the passion that we have for uh, souls, but specifically for the local church. I know you travel around the world, and you mentioned that, where um, you get to work with pastors and work with seminaries and local churches. And uh, tell us a little bit of what you've been doing lately when it comes to your studies. I know you're a medical doctor, but when it comes to your theological training, what have you been doing lately? Well, well, I went to a conference some time ago, and I learned that 95, 90 to 95% of pastors around the world have no formal training. And I was going to seminary, and uh, so I, I thought that I could, I would love to do that, to be able to uh, share and to, um, to serve and to minister and to disciple pastors around the world that are less fortunate, don't have the technology or the literature. They have a Bible. Some of them didn't even have Bibles, the ones I've come across. And to be able to present the Word of God in such a way that they're able to minister to their congregation and evangelize and disciple at the local church as well as in their communities. And uh, I was, I'm very excited about that. And I've been doing that uh, for about 12 years now. And that's mm. brought a great joy to me. That's unbelievable. That's, that's wonderful. And, and, and thank you for what you do. Thank you because I know the kingdom is a lot better because of you and your investment and getting to know you and, and listening to the stories that you come back with and, and then seeing your family just at work is always a blessing. Now, today, what we want to do is to spend a, a few minutes just, uh, again, looking into the scriptures and specifically 
when it comes to the issue of uh, again this pandemic situation which is chaotic and and even as we record this podcast um, for us in South Texas because we, you and I we both are here in, in the in the mission area in, in South Texas uh, we officially began today our lockdown you know mm-hmm. shelter in from our officials and we're following instructions we're trying to obviously you know, restrict ourselves from going outside and the social distance and all that kinds of stuff. And, and all those things are important and they're necessary. But ultimately, David, when it comes to, when it comes to the antidote, when it comes to the actual, um, you know, navigating this uncertainty, this unprecedented, you know, experience that we see in today's culture and the world, where, where would you go in the Bible? What would you look at in the scriptures as, as even as we see God or Jesus, the Holy Spirit, is speaking to the people of God? Well, there's so many passages in scripture, but I'm, I want to zero down on one. It's found in John chapter 14, verse 27. And I'll read it, and then um, we, can, uh, we can expound on that. Mm-hmm. Peace I leave with you. Peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. And I, I, I can rest on that because we see in John chapter 13, 14, 15, and 16, Jesus is with his disciples in the upper room. Uh, and he's making these promises. These are promises to the disciples. And he's telling them that where I go, I prepare a place for you. I will return. I will, the Holy Spirit, I don't leave you as orphans. I leave you the spirit of truth. And then now he's talking about peace. And in chapter 17 in John, it says, not, and, and Jesus is praying to the Father. This is the true Lord's prayer. Mm-hmm. And he says, not only these that are with me, but for those that will believe. That's you and me as Mm -hmm. believers Mm -hmm. that Christ gives us. And what's uh, so amazing is this is Jesus giving, uh, speaking of giving peace right before he's going to the cross, right before he's going to carry all the sin and transgressions of the world on him and and be on the cross uh, brutally tortured and beaten and and father father why has i forsaken this is what's coming mm-hmm. so there's so much going on here and i believe as believers we can we can focus on these scriptures and be reassured on the word of god because it's a promise that jesus gives to his believers now, the one thing that you remind me when I listen to the Bible verses you selected to share with us tonight, I'm reminded of the heart of a shepherd that Jesus was to this man. Typically for, you know, passages like this, this is what we call eyewitnesses. They, they were present when Jesus spoke to them. But as a, as a father, I get the privilege, I get the privilege to, to, to be a father, as you are also. And, and one of the things that we do as parents, the, the, the father heart, you know, the heart of a father, uh, is sometimes we give warnings to, to our kids. We, we give them promises, but we also give them warnings. So, so part of me wants to read these passages with a, with a sense of a warning as well. Because obviously this is history, so now we're reading what happened. This is the upper room experience. This is the moment right before the the, the Passover celebration, the Lord's Supper, the betrayal of Judas, you know, Hetsemane comes into place, then hell breaks loose. And it it seems to me that Jesus is warning them. And, and, and here's what I want to say, and, and I want you to elaborate on this because I know, I know, I know you are a great dad, and, and I know you do a great job shepherding pastors, and, and I know you love the local church. But one of the challenges that I see with, with Jesus and with God as fathers or as shepherds over our lives, and, and I'm thinking of our context today, is that Jesus, as much as he warns, as much as he promises, and as much as he delivers the goods or the promises, he always makes people responsible for their choices. Right. So I'm thinking as a father, you know, this is so difficult because our tendency is that we want to either cover up, we want to rescue our children sometimes before they actually face the reality of life. But anyways, all that to say is that in this conversation, in this passage, do you see any of that Jesus making these disciples accountable for exercising this peace that we're reading about? Jesus' methods in discipling was always invitational but challenging. 
invitational but challenging. The invitation here is peace I leave with you, my peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Okay, There's the invitation. But let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. There's a challenge. Mm. Because we live in a real world. We can't be willy-nilly. This is not positive thinking. This is not white knuckle wishing. This is the word of God. So it's an invitation as, we, as well as a challenge. And I believe Christ was so effective in discipling this way. And if you, you see many, many scriptures, that's how it was. Mm. It, uh, you know, uh, so follow me. That was the invitation. And I will make you fishers. That's the mm-hmm. challenge. Mm-hmm. Yeah, on and on, and there's many examples. So I see it in this scripture, as you pointed out. Well, and, and again, uh, the, 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 the beauty of this conversation between Jesus and the disciples is that for this to take place, it seems to me, and I'm not prophesizing, I'm not, I'm not anticipating, but I see the pattern that in this dialogue between Jesus and the disciples, it seems to me that it is in the context of difficulties and challenges that these things come into pass. And, and I'm, I'm, again, I am not promoting the coronavirus. I'm not saying that this is the perfect scenario. All that I'm saying is that um, since this is a both end of the conversation, I'm obviously more concerned of the, of the role that we play, you and I play, our children right. play, society, the local church, on how to navigate this. So anyways, um, uh, talk to us about how this is going to unfold uh, as, you, as you look in the scriptures and in, 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 in what you are speaking to us. How, how, how does Jesus expand this conversation as we continue the conversation tonight? Well, see, when he talk, he's talking about this piece I leave, this peace I give to you. We have to understand. And, I, and, and, and in Romans chapter 4, 24 to 25, we have to understand that um, we were enemies of God. So what mm-hmm. Jesus is talking about, we have a peace with God. Let me just read some uh, passages and that will illuminate. Mm-hmm. But for ours also, it will be counted to us who believe in him who raised from the dead, Jesus, our Lord, who was delivered up for our trespasses and raised for our justification mm. through Jesus. Okay. And then in Romans 5, 1, therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. That is paramount. We have peace with God. When someone talks about peace, they may say that's the absence of anxiety, the absence of turmoil, the absence of crisis, the absence of sickness. But no, no, no. We have peace with God. And that is, that is so refreshing. And that's so reassuring mm-hmm. as us believers that we have peace with God. That's why Paul said this gospel, the uh, gospel of peace is that we have peace with God. And that this is the peace that Jesus has taught, supernatural, divine, outside of us. This is what God has done through Christ. It's not something that, uh, that we, if we believe more or we don't believe, this is what God has done. So, so let me ask you this question, because this is such a crucial, crucial conversation for our context and I think it was for the context of again going back to the disciples now Paul is speaking to the church in Rome over a subject that has to do with the justification component and and, and it, it is no irony that the concept of justification the doctrine of the justification goes side to side with the concept of peace and, and I'm bringing this up David because it seems to me that the justification component and the peace component if they are intertwined, if they are kind of a, a one experience altogether, um, uh, my understanding of this is that this is something that God creates, brings into the picture, provides, the, the, the word that we typically use in theology is imputes, accredits to us, before there is change in our lives, in a sense of behavior. And I'm saying this because, unfortunately, when I read some things on social media, a lot of people see the context that we're in based on either the judgment of God, uh, the anger of God, the discipline of God. And there may be some truth to that. Uh, you know, obviously, I don't know exactly how this is unfolding and how, why this is happening. But all that I'm saying is that 
I feel that sometimes people, the undercurrent of those statements is that if we behave, God will bless. If we misbehave, behave, God will punish. And, and all that I'm saying is that that, that that is not the biblical component of peace because to me, this justification and this peace, they both seem to be forensic. That's something that God gives us, not because we're going to become a better version of ourselves, but in spite of what we do. To that, what, what would you say, brother? Well, let's read uh, Romans 5, 10, and 11. It says, For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, mm -hmm. much more now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life. See, we were enemies. Christ did this. Christ died on the cross. He, re he brought peace with God. He didn't wait for us to not be sinners. He did this while we were sinners. Mm -hmm. And in Romans 5.11, it says, more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. Now peace and joy. See, this is mm -hmm. what torments people. This is what's tormenting people. I mean, medically speaking, people, anxiety, the depression, the worries, the hopelessness, there's a void in us. There is no joy. There is no peace. Peace that we're talking about, peace with God. Only God can give this through Jesus Christ. And this is what the world is seeking right now. And us as believers, you know, granted, everything that's going around with us, we can rest that God is sovereign and we and peace. And now we have joy because we have peace with God. And because that we've been justified, nothing deserving, we, we have the peace of God now. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful thing. I don't know if you ever went to court or wherever and, 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 and you had favor with the judge. <laughs> I did when I was younger. And uh, <laughs> I had no peace with the judge. Yeah, 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 yeah. With the judge, the almighty God, we can rest in that. That brings joy and tranquility and, and, and hope for, for us as believers. And now that everybody is seeking and everybody is searching, you know, Jesus said in the Sermon on the Mount, we are the light, we are the salt. And right now people are uh, uh, desperate and they're looking for this peace, but it's the only peace that Jesus can give. And again, you're bringing me back into what I said on Sunday when I preached this past Sunday. Um, and and I, I'm, I'm going to say it again this coming Sunday in a sense of this concept of a peace that comes from Christ or in this case, you know, the joy. Now you're using the word joy. But part of this has to do with a legal status, it, with, not, not based on the circumstances only, although it matters, but it's the legal status that you know, again, going back to Romans and the justification component, when it comes to being justified with God and having peace with God and having the joy of God implies that not only that we have been forgiven, but we also now we have, we, we have a status before God in spite of our circumstances that we are perceived and seen by God as someone that has never seen. And then mm -hmm. I'm, I'm also reminded because part of this brokenness and part of the, the being enemies of God is that we violated the law. We violated the commands of the Lord. So in this case, when it comes to this forensic justification, forensic um, uh, joy and peace, now implies that because of the forensic agent, which is Jesus, so it comes through Jesus, now we are seen legally as someone who has completed and fulfilled the law. So God sees me as an actual person who actually obey all of the commandments, which I haven't, but Jesus right. has in and then the last thing that I will say, David, and then we'll, we'll go into the last part of our conversation, which is one of the most attractive things, um, is, is in this whole concept of the forensic component is now that God sees me as a family member, mm. you know, as part of the family of God, which again comes into the joy, into the experience of just having Jesus as part of that. David, as we close our time together uh, tonight, Talk to me about now, uh, how do you bring this into a closing? What, what would you say to, to the average you know, person, uh, young man, maybe you know, the person who is on, the, on that 70-year-old mark, 65-year-old uh, mark, 80-year-old mark, you know, maybe the third generation that we find ourselves? What, what would you say in closing uh, tonight? Well, so, so now that we, we have the peace, we're peace with God, peace of God, uh, you know, just to, we can, 
trust in God, mm -hmm. just like Jesus did before Pilate. Pilate was upset because Jesus didn't answer his question. And, and Pilate basically is telling him, do you know who I am? And, and Jesus is like, only what my father will allow you to do. So mm -hmm. that is trust. I mean, amazing trust, Jesus, trust the Father. So this peace, this joy brings trust and rely on God is in control of all things. And whatever happens is God allowed it. And what he does not allow, he will not allow. Mm -hmm. And how does that all come? Is by walking on the path of righteousness. You see, because you're overjoyed. You have this joy, you have this peace, you have this trust, you have a heart of thanksgiving, you're, and you're pursuing and you're contemplating in the greatness of God. And let me just close with this uh, and, and, and how we can think about this, because this is the, this invitation, now the challenge, okay? This is not willy-nilly. This is not just pie in the sky, oh, just, you know, uh, superficial. And, and in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8 to 9, here Paul's telling us, Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there is any, any excellency, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things, what you have learned and received and heard and seen in me. Practice these things and the God of peace will be with you. God is good. God is holy. God is righteous. As you dive into the scriptures and you have a high view of God, the sovereignty of God, the character of God, that will lift you up and seeking the, uh, the kingdom and all his righteousness and these things mm -hmm. shall be added unto you. So peace brings joy because we trust on the path of righteousness. Mm -hmm. And as believers, this is, this is an encouragement. This is a promise. The, in, the invitation and the challenge. Let us be a light. Let us be an assault pointing to the one who gives, the only one that can give true peace is our Lord Jesus Christ. You, you are killing me with this Bible references, brother, because I, I have to go back in my mind and remind myself that Philippians is one of those prison letters. So mm -hmm. this brother is speaking from some of the most challenging and difficult times in life speaking of the yeah. author paul in writing to churches who they were in a lot of turmoil as well so so definitely this is something that we have to take into serious consideration david what i want us to do before we close our time i like for you to lead us in prayer i like for you to pray because again you're in the front line lines of the reality you're seeing patients you have a lot of friends a lot of folks that are working alongside with you from nurses and office managers and and, and you guys I mean, come on, you're, you're facing this reality. So would you pray for the, for the medical field? Would you pray for our physicians? And, and also, would you pray for those who are actually going through the actual illness of this virus today? Okay. Father, we just come to you in the honor, giving you honor and praise. We come to you humbly, Lord. We come with a heart uh, that's broken because of a broken world, Lord. Mm -hmm. Lord, glorify yourself in this time of crisis. Glorify yourself, Lord. Reveal yourself, your splendor, your glory, your mercies. Lord, I ask you for my colleagues and the physicians and the nurses and all those that are involved in healthcare, Lord, that we come to a, a, a standstill knowing that you are the physician of physicians, that we can look up to you and, and give us hearts of grace and compassion and mercy as we take care of patience dear lord and god i ask you for those that are ill glorify yourself lord glorify yourself in healings and salvation bringing honor and glory to you lord and i ask you for my brother who's a pastor my pastor rick and other pastors that come for them as they're comforting many other people lord and lord that the the believers those that are your children will stand up and be a light and the mm -hmm. salt in this world mm -hmm. and glorify yourself that all can look to you as there is no other God. You are holy. You are righteous. We love you because you first loved us. And we ask you this in Jesus name. Amen. Amen. Brother, thank you for your time. Truly appreciate you, David.
Thank you, Vidal, and this is wonderful. And uh, may, may who hears this be blessed and just rest in the peace of God, peace of God, and just think on the beauty and the magnificent God that we have. Thank you, brother. God bless you. God bless. We'll see you. Bye-bye.